Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. Today's guest, world-renowned drummer and speaker, Mark Showman. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, Rock and Rollers? Yep, it's that time. It's another episode of the Rich Redman Show coming to you remotely because these are the new times that we're living in. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, co-producer Jim McCarthy. How you doing, Jim? I'm doing well. How are you? How- How's Music City, USA? I'm coming from Los Angeles. It's hot. All I got to say is the sun is shining here and there's zero humidity. And if it's not zero, it's a heck of a lot less than Nashville. Hey, uh, you, Mr. What what do we call you? A quintagenarian now? Yeah, guys, I had the 50th birthday party. But you know, we got to save that because, Jim, when we're in person with each other, usually we'll kibitz a little bit for about 10 minutes. We'll talk about current events and then we'll introduce our guest. But today, I just want to get right into it because we've already been talking off camera. This is one of my favorite people. He's a world-class drummer, 13 years with Pink. He's also toured, recorded with Cher, Foreigner, Velvet Revolver, Cheryl Crow, Stevie Nicks, Richard Marks, Dave Koz, Tina Turner, the list goes on and on. He's an author. He's a speaker. He's my friend since 2002, Mark Shulman. Oh, go on, Rich. This is my <laughs> pleasure. It's about time we do this. Yeah, I've waited man. a long time. How you been? I'm excited. I feel very honored. And let's just rock and roll this thing. Yeah. We're doing it. We're doing it. So, so uh, you know, everybody in the know that's watching this show, listening to this show, consuming this show, knows that, uh, we, hey, we talk about all things music motivation and success. Um, so I'm talking to comedians, thought leaders, authors, speakers, but there's a lot of drummers because drummers are special people. Um, a lot of you guys know that my co-host, Jim McCarthy, drummer, has a lot of my gear. I just kind of permanently loaned to him. Speaking and of that, uh, I need some yeah. more. So. <laughs> let's, let's get on that, okay? <laughs> so, Mark, what, I was trying to think when we saw each other last, and I just had an aha moment. We saw each other hanging out on Vine Street um, for the Hollywood Pro Drum Christmas Party. That's the last time. That's the last time we saw each other because we skipped. We I skipped Nam this year, so. Oh, and I did go to Nam, and I didn't see you at Nam, so I was there. Um, and sometimes I skip Nam. It just depends. I mean, what we're doing. The year before, I was at Nam for two hours, and then my mom got sick, and I literally left. So it was nice to be there the last year. But you weren't there. We missed you. I tell you what, I mean, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, who knows? Maybe a lot of people ended up getting this COVID beast uh, at NAM this year. Because remember, we always talk about NAM thrax, how it's just kind of like, yeah, no matter how many times you sanitize, it's in the air. It's in yeah. the circulated air. Especially inside. I mean, the key is really staying outside. If you're going to, if you're going to be social at all, do it outside. Everybody just wear a mask, social distance. It is so simple and try to hang out outside. I know. Why is this so hard for people? What is the deal? <laughs> because people tend to be in denial. And I think that it also feels very oppressive. And a lot of people are rebellious. I mean, we're musicians. We understand what it's like to be rebellious. But it's sort of like the, the, you're the effect of the wrong cause. Don't rebel against yourself <laughs> or, or others. The way that I look at it is wearing a mask is also securing the health of other people. And I like to be of service constantly, correct? That's part of our, you know, our life's journey, really. So it just makes sense. But I'm yeah. not going to preach any more about that. Let's talk about some other things. Yes. I mean, at this point, I'm collecting all sorts of different colors, sizes, and shape masks. Um, but, yeah, so my brother, you're from Los Angeles, right? You're a valley boy. I am you're an valley actual boy? valley boy, born and raised in Woodland Hills, which ironically, later in life, Woodland Hills was the home of the Woodland Hills Drum Club because a lot of great drummers, Don Perry lived there and Greg Bissonette and Kurt Biscara, all these people lived there and they all kind of moved out and uh, Denny Sewell still lives there. Um, but that was, uh, that be- so it became cool after I left. But yeah, I grew up in the Valley. 
I left and moved to Portland, Oregon with a band in the 80s, which was one of the best things I'd ever done because when I came back to Los Angeles, it gave me the perspective that everybody else gets as an entertainment professional transplant. When you come in, I, I wasn't so myopic. I was like, oh, I get what everybody else sees as opposed to like, you know, seeing it from so being so insular. Mm. Um, so it was, a, it was a great experience to get away and come back. And I loved living in Portland as well. It was a different world completely. I'm sure it's changed since you have been there. Have you been back a couple of times? I have been back many times and it has not changed that much. Wow. Um, what I love about Portland is Portland is like a big, small town and there are so many mom and pop stores. Um, and it really, it, it, it's still more personalized than most cities. Um, but they have a lot of culture, and the music scene when I was there was extraordinary. That was pre-grunge. I was there in the 80s, so all the Portland bands were considered to be really, really cool. And we would go up to Seattle and play, and then the late 80s, then when grunge popped out, then all of a sudden everything was about Seattle. But uh, Portland has always really had an extraordinary, excuse me, an eclectic scene of incredibly gifted people, and still does, actually. And as a matter of yeah. fact, um, I just <laughs> spoke to a friend of mine, Dan Reed, Dan Reed Network. Dan got a, got a record deal. He was part of like the whole clan of people that I was with. And he actually started my first original band. Um, and we are actually doing a, I'm doing a benefit concert for a friend of mine, Matt Kolb, who is, uh, has fourth stage cancer. Uh -huh. And so there are going to be a lot of musicians performing and I'm collecting videos from people. I want to do this in the next two weeks. Uh, and Dan, Dan has already sent me a couple of videos that he recorded. So it's fantastic. Yeah. Well, man. And so I know what you mean by, by getting away. You, you, you didn't realize, you didn't have this perspective on how special Tinseltown is in Southern California is until you left and came back and you're like, oh my God, everybody from all over the world comes here because it's one of the entertainment capitals of the world. Yeah, most people are transplants. <clears throat> and um, the reason why I also bring up Dan is Dan was the person that was responsible for getting me my first big audition in the 80s for this band called Bad English that was the guys from Journey and the singer John Waite. And I, I horribly failed that audition. And that was the impetus for my first book, Conquering Life Stage Fright, actually. Nice. Because through the failure of that audition, um, one, I sped up horribly. Um, two, I was just overwhelmed with stage fright. So I made two promises to myself after that audition. Um, one is I was going to, I, ne I would never be in the position where someone else was telling me to speed up or slow down unless I want to speed up or slow down. And two is I was going to transfer that fear into confidence. And so that's what I did. I spent two years just in just working um, on the rhythm course, which is still taught by Tom Mendola. You can still find him available. Just working on my internal meter solidly for two years and then just studying all bits of philosophy. I uh, acquired the mentor of my life, who's the gentleman who's writing my next book with me, Dr. Jim Samuels, who taught me so much philosophically. And I've just studied everybody like you, Rich. I study everybody I can. Everybody from, you know, Gary V to um, Ray Dalio, the investor, to uh, Wayne Dyer, to, um, Grant Cardone, who we both interviewed, I interviewed him for my book, I interviewed him for this show. I, I am just a, 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 what I call a chronic student. I cannot learn enough. And the, fun, the, the interesting thing I find is the more I learn, the more I realize I need to know. So it's always humbling. I never get to the point where I feel like, oh, I've arrived, I've got it. It's kind of like, all I, it's like I continually open up Pandora's boxes of information that I go, oh my gosh, there's so much to learn, but I love it. That's what keeps yeah. us alive. We're either growing or dying. And you know, I'm a guy who's in my 50s, man. I'm growing, brother, and I love it. It excites me to no end. And See that's that, the reason why I speak. That's the impetus to becoming a speaker was the same reason as you. You know, we take our life experience and we take all the philosophies and everything we've known and we realize we have leverage and we have a platform to be able to share our experiences. Because I believe everybody can learn from everybody else. 
And if you actualize your leverage in your platform, then you have the opportunity to be of service to others to then share your experiences. And that's what we do. That's what you do with your podcast, with your book, with your speaking. That's what I'm doing with my book. I don't even have a podcast, but I do it with my speaking and my book and and my coaching in any way that I can. Yeah. It's 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 inspiring, right, Jim? (laughs) <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's it's funny because can't, isn't it funny, you know, there's something that I, when I learned way back in the car business, a phrase that says, when you're green, you grow. When you're ripe, you're rot. And <laughs> I like that, that one. Amazing? I have, yeah. can, I, can, I, can I borrow slash steal that from you? <laughs> you can, yeah, do it's it. not mine. So it's, I don't know, author unknown. But I mean, basically, yeah. can't you just tell the people who would, you know, they're just, they're just shut off. You know, you could just, you yeah. feel it from them that they're just, you know, I'm done. I've learned everything I can. Yeah. You know? I mean, but you're speaking my language. Well, and I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, and, and Jim, Jim said, hey, Rich, I can feel like, because we've been friends for so long, he's like, you know, you're coming up on 50, and I feel like you almost feel like philosophically you have one foot in the grave, like there's some terror, like, oh, my God, um, uh, did, have I saved enough money? Because uh, surely I'm going to start falling apart now. But, uh, you know, I mean, there's, I, I just, I crack up at people that say I'm so bored. For guys like us, it's like, well, what about all the literature and fiction and nonfiction to read? And then all the uh, the movies and the great content and then drumming videos and practicing and working. There's so much to work on. Oh, my God. I, I, I can't remember the last time I've been bored. For me, it's like I'm struggling for more time, for more hours, more moments in the day. Mm-hmm. To me, every moment is literally precious. As a matter of fact, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I say, which I learned from one of the people that I – I love Tom Billyu and his, uh, his impact theory. It's this great YouTube channel where he interviews all the – just the greatest performers and thinkers. But somebody said – They wake up in the morning, they go, ah, 24 brand new hours. So the first thing I do, that's the first thing I do is I wake up and I say 24 brand new hours. The next thing I do is smile, literally, Mm -hmm. because I know that when you smile, it changes your physiology. It literally activates hundreds of muscles in your face that tells your body to relax and sends endorphins to your brain. And then I think of three people and three things for which I'm grateful. That's part of my morning routine because gratitude is so incredibly powerful. I just read an, an, uh, a, a bit of information about gratitude that someone just did a test. They, they, they gave a, lot of, a, a group of people MRIs and they had them just conjure up and immerse themselves in as much gratitude as they could. And they found that these people were emitting the same amount of endorphins you would admit you would emit with a low level antidepressant. So the power of gratitude is so huge. And so I and I know a lot of people are are tapping into that more and more especially in this day of covid because it's really critical. Uh you know the opposite of gratitude is sort of that that uh attitude of uh entitlement entitlement well, yeah. scarcity, where you're focusing on the challenges, the anxiety, the blocks, the barriers. When you're focusing on gratitude, you're focusing on your appreciation, past, present, and future. You're focusing on your wins, your solutions. It really orients everything that you are and everything that you do, which is the topic of my next book and my current speaking topic, which is on the power of attitude. Because we can't control what happens to us. We know that is evidenced by this global pandemic, for God's sakes. But you always have the power to change, control, shift your attitude about what happens to you. And this is enormously powerful because your attitude is your point of view. I call it your vantage point or your disadvantage point, depending upon the attitude you choose. But it's not what we, it's not what we look at. It's what we see and what we perceive. An attitude is so powerful based on the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and about the world and the meaning that we attach to people, places, and circumstances. But what is so incredibly powerful about attitude, it's, the, it's really the foundation of this enormous formula that Dr. Jim came up with, A times B equals C, because our attitude is what actually drives our behaviors. So by understanding that you can shift your attitude, you can actually change your behavior. That's huge, man. And then your behavior is what determines the consequences of your life. 
So by understanding that you have the power at any moment to choose your attitude, you can literally drive different outcomes in your life. And that is what I base my life on every single day. I've been employing this formula into my life every single day. And that's why I'm convinced I'm still healthy, alive, and have a, have a, 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 a career that's still, you know, I'm doing quite well in what I do. I mean, especially given the circumstance. I mean, certainly as speakers, we've literally need to, we've needed to, um, manage change. I mean, in all industries right now, it's about managing change. And there's two ways to manage change. You either embrace it or you resist it. And if you embrace it, that means you look for new and unique ways of getting things done, of taking different and unique and profound action. And so I was very resistant to take my speaking gig and put it online as a virtual speaking gig, because like you, I play drums and it's very interactive, but I figured out the moment I stopped resisting it and embraced it, wow, I've come up with all these creative ideas as to how to make this virtual presentation work. And now I'm doing virtual presentations for clients and I'm having just as much of an impact as I did when I was doing it live. Nice. And that is really kind of the way to handle all situations personally and professionally as far as I'm concerned. It's like you either embrace it or you resist it because we – literally manifest whatever we focus on. And if you're focusing on the challenges, guess what? You get more challenges. If you're focusing on what can be done and what's possible, you create possibility. I so it. I can go on and on and on, but I have a lot of philosophies as you do. I know a lot of our, our, our philosophies are similar. Your crash course is amazing. Oh, and thanks, man. I, you know, mine's called rocking the, uh, hacking the rock star attitude, but it's all based on similarity on movement and on finding possibility and on literally choosing attitudes and creating behavior and consequences that we never imagined possible and then affecting each other, affecting others because our attitudes are so contagious. Yeah. Everything we do is contagious. My energy is gonna be contagious. If I come on here, not only with just a negative attitude, but an attitude of why things aren't gonna work and um, a doomsday attitude, oh my God, I can't even listen. I don't even listen to the news anymore. I listen to it minutely just so I have an idea as to what's going on. But I try my dear friend, Tim Sanders, your friend, Tim Sanders. Yeah. He said the greatest thing years ago. He says, fill your mind with good stuff. <laughs> the better stuff you fill your mind with, the more oriented you are to create that attitude of good stuff. And it's really critical because it's so easy to get obsessed with all the negativity, particularly with what's going on now. And now is the time that we really need to consciously, consciously focus on things that are going to inspire us at any moment that we can. It's critical for us. I mean, it's our lifeline. It's my lifeline. It's your lifeline. It's everybody's lifeline or else we are going to atrophy into a into and spiral into an even worse situation than we're in now yeah no i mean i agree all the way and, and jim is always saying um you know where, marinate where your mind in good stuff <laughs> yeah marinate your mind in good stuff There's a and, podcast and, out there about that i think but <laughs> <laughs> right. so, you know the gratitude thing so important like when i wake up and i take my shower in the morning I, could, I do my gratitude list and that's very powerful to think about all the things in your life that uh, just other people would die to have. There's so many unfortunate people out there. And if you, can, if you can walk and talk and you have the use of your senses and you're a sentient being and you have your, your wits about you and you could do something, ah, man, it's like we can make such a difference in, in, in people's lives. And I, you know, you're just a few years older than me and I've been drawing on inspiration from you and I'm sure you drew on inspiration from your two colleagues and mentors and a guy like maybe, I think like Dom Famulero, maybe have been the first oh, speaking Dom drummer. Been, you Dom know? Been such an inspiration for all of us. I mean, what an and amazing I think it, Then it was you and then it was like, I started to run with things and now we got guys like, you know, Matt Starr and, 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 uh, and Kenny that are like all doing things and we all have our own take on it. And yeah. you, if you notice that we're the drum, we're the passionate guys in the band, I don't see a lot of guitar players and bass players doing keynotes. <laughs> it's yeah you know well you know i i mean there, there's a small group of people that that are doing similar keynotes to us i mean freddie Ravel, who's a keyboard yep, player who was the musical director for santana and for um 
Earth, Wind & Fire. Freddie does an amazing keynote. And my friend Mike Rayburn, who is a guitar player, who- Yeah, but uh, there's not a list of six but, guitar no, there's, players. There's very few of us that are really, well, because, you know, I, I grew up doing drum clinics, man. I did a thousand drum clinics. This is an extension of the drum clinics. The difference is we really needed to refine our craft to, be, to make it applicable to the corporate world. And I don't know about you, but I, you know, studied with two speaking coaches and acting coach, a director. I mean, I know you've studied acting like a beast. You're a professional actor now, which <laughs> adds so much leverage and credibility and skill set to being able to present effectively. Because it's like, like as drummers, right? It's not what we play, it's how we play it, right? As musicians, that's, it's, it's, you know, you can play like this. <laughs> which is the beat we play 90% of the time. We can play like, like every single note matters. I attach a sense of purpose to every single note. And when I attach a sense of purpose, the purpose creates more passion. The passion fosters more purpose. And I just simply have more fun. I mean, I played So What by Pink 800 times. How the hell else can I make the 800th time feel just as passionate as the first time? Yeah. And speaking of the first time, I played with Foreigner on and off for, what, 28 years. And I remember we were in the middle of a big tour. I was about to go on stage. And we had been out for a long time. I was thinking to myself, oh, my God, I must have played this song. Feels like the first time. Hundreds of times. It's like God's big joke. And then <laughs> the next night, I went on stage. And right before I was about to start, I looked at the eyes in the audience. And I thought, wait a minute. For Almost all these people, this really is their first time. So how dare I deprive their first time experience when I can create a conscious attitude shift right there and share in their first time experience and everybody wins. Yeah. So for me, it is all about realizing that, first of all, everything in my life is about being of service. It finally hit me. Every single thing, when I get on stage, I'm there to be of service to Pink, to the band members, to the audience, when I'm in front of a corporate audience, I'm there to be of service to the meeting planner, to the C-suite, to the audience, to my manager, to the agent. I want everybody to look good. I, I just I want to be completely egoless because to me, I just feel like I'm blessed to be the conduit for information, for drumming. I mean, we do the work, right? It is our responsibility to, to clock the, you know, the 10 to 30,000 hours like Gladwell talks, Malcolm Gladwell talks about that, but he got that from somebody else. I don't even remember whom. But we're conduits, man. So to me, that's the greatest thing to take your ego out of it. Because once, if I start getting egotistical, man, I want my ass kicked. Because it ain't about me, it's about we. And I'm just so blessed that it comes through me. You know, that the inspiration that I wake up, like you wake up with the inspiration, it comes through you. I don't go, well, I'm so great because I have the inspiration to do this and this. I'm like, I'm so blessed because somehow this came through me and I can figure out a way to channel it and I can figure out a way to be of service to everybody else. To me, that's what it's like. And I think if people viewed it more that way, then we wouldn't be let we wouldn't be ego driven we would be service driven and being service driven yeah. rather than ego driven is a whole different attitude it's a whole different point of view i mean yeah let's face it i mean jim i know feels the same way because he's always providing voiceovers for people or producing their podcasts or, and he's got a electrical company a little side hustle he's got that's probably going to pay off huge for him everything i do whether it be helping bring a a, a, a script to life or playing drums for someone on a song or on the stage or teaching someone a drum lesson. It's all for someone else. I mean, we are providing a service. I mean, literally it is a high, maybe a slightly higher version of fries with that. You know, it's like whatever color yeah. they want, however, what speed they want, what attitude they want, we're going to give it to them. Now, Mark, I, we can come back to the speaking thing. I'd like that. Um, but I know that your beginning in music education was, cello your first instrument was the cello was it not <laughs> well as the story goes i've told the story many times but um i was like you know two or three years old i still remember seeing the beatles on ed sullivan on television and i was transfixed and i saw john and george and paul and i was like oh my god this is i've never seen anything like this and then i saw ringo and it was like something inside just 
burst and I saw you know the you know the big beautiful nose and the and the, and the way that he was like swishing on the hi-hat and it was like then I saw the screaming girls and I love that as much I'm like I'm in then all yeah. I kept telling my mama for a few years mama I want to play drums she's like no it's too loud can't you play a nice instrument like your brother Randy he plays violin so how yeah. it happened was my my godfather my uncle ben was teaching my brother violin i'd go to his lessons and i saw this instrument in the corner it looked like a big violin and i said okay mama i'll play that and it was cello so at five years six years old whatever it was i started just playing cello then my uncle ben started giving me a drum lesson at the end of his cello lesson but also at five years old i sat at a drum set at a neighbor's house they had a band and i could play I wasn't a prodigy, but I knew what to do. It was just, it, I feel like drums chose me. I didn't choose drums. For right. me, it was just a matter of like badgering my parents until they were, I was nine years old and they couldn't deny my passion and they got me like, my first drum kit, which was a Slingerland Radio King kit that I wish I still had. Yeah, why do we always get rid of our first kits? <laughs> I know, man, how ridiculous. And so I started playing in a band from nine years old, 12 years old, I played my first professional gig. From the age of 14, every weekend I was playing weddings and bar mitzvahs and, you know, my friends were delivering pizzas and working everywhere else. And I was making 100 to 200 bucks a gig yeah. because my friend Steve Diamond, who's still one of my best friends, was booking the band. He was 16. Everybody else is 16. I was 14. And we just grew up over the next four years just playing, putting on tuxes and and playing, you know, bossa novas and, and, and you know, kind of blue. Shuffles jazz yeah. standards and and songs you know like everything from zeppelin to like top 40 songs to whatever happened to be around man so well now is that steve diamond the the hit songwriter with 50 no, top 10 no, okay. no. different steve no. diamond because he diamond. lives in nashville and i've worked for him but now jim this makes me the story of the cello and music education it makes me think of the school of rock which we appreciate and are very grateful for Kelly and Angie McCray, they run one of the top two I love the Rocks. And Angie. Aren't they incredible? You've done so many things for them as well. Yeah, I've and done they're like just three, three, I think three uh, presentations with them. Yes, yeah. I mean, there's 250 locations in the world and they are always have a winning combination. They're cranking out amazing musicians, kids that want to be drummers. They want to sing songs. They want to play yeah. keyboards, bass, guitar. And uh, you could go, you could sign up, it's very easy. So parents, if your kids are taking ballet, they're playing baseball, they're playing soccer, they're in modern dance classes, they're taking acting, you wanna get them some rock lessons. Mark, just imagine if we had this when we were growing up. Oh my God. I mean, the, 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 what's so great about School of Rock is it's, they immediately put you in an ensemble, so you're immediately playing in a band. Yes. All I wanted to do was play in bands. It was so right. hard to find anybody that I could play with. And, you know, the chief, op chief operating officer, Stacy Ryan, is one of my best friends. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I've done so much stuff with School of Rock over the years, done so many presentations. I spoke at their franchisee convention. I've done dozens and dozens of presentations for their schools. It's an amazing model. It really yes. is. They've got it dialed, man. they got it dialed. We love them. So, parents, if your kids want to get involved with School of Rock, we got two email addresses for you. Tell them that we sent you. Mar uh, Jim, what, is, what are the email addresses? Nashville at schoolofrock.com and Franklin at schoolofrock.com. Uh, I, I just, just got to remark on Jim's voice for a minute. It's I good, feel like right? a little 10-year-old kid next to you. you got that marvelous professional voice. And I just feel like this, hey, raunchy rocker, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank it's you. so good it's so good man i try to surround myself with greatness it's so, so good mark, to be around adults isn't it rich <laughs> <laughs> so mark some of your speaking clients now if everybody is they're curious and they want to know about mark the author speaker educator musician they go to mark and it's s-c-h olman.com and some of your uh clients are cisco yahoo zappos american express aveda walmart um, do you take a different approach for each client or is it kind of like a, they get to choose from the three speeches or you just say, this is what you're getting. How does it work? Um, what I do is I give the, the client as much choice within the realm of a certain um, script that I have. Uh, because actually 95% of the presentations I do are the Hacking the Rockstar Attitude. Nice. I rarely do Conquering Life Stage Fright. That's my first book. 
Right. It was called Conquering Life Stage Fright, Three Steps to Top Performance. It was more about the steps to top performance, but was a great lead in sort of uh, attractive title. Um, and I also do, uh, you know, boosting your RQ, your rock star quotient. But what I do is I take a framework that I work within, just like you, and then I adapt it and customize it to their individual mandate, depending on whether I'm speaking to a sales team or IT people or the entire company or the top performers, um, you know, sales technology, healthcare, uh, uh, wow. Pharma, I, I, I farming. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a big pharma. I, I literally like you spoken to every possible um, company, association, you know, forensic accounting my i'm still friends with hank i spoke to for his forensic accounting company we're still friends yeah. you know i'm still friends with a lot of the c the c-suite people that i speak speak with um but it's really all about you know again providing a service to make sure that they're happy and sometimes we'll have one pre-conference call sometimes we'll have five it depends yeah. on how much information they want and what we want to go how much they want to go over the content and how much how involved they are some people say just motivate everybody but i call myself an activational speaker not a motivational speaker because to me i want people i want to inspire people to take action because motivation is just the beginning temporary Shot in the arm. you need to be motivated to do anything but to, when you're activated that means you are inspired to actually do something right away that's going to improve your life and the life of others and I that's to me what it's about not just raw 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 and that's Kind of, honestly, that's what sets you and I aside from a lot of the people because there are so many great like drum like clinicians, people that do clinics, and like you, I'm sure I've I've been contacted by so many people who say I want to do what you're doing. I said, well, that's great. It's just going to take quite a few years to refine and understand how the corporate world works and how the corporate messaging works and how to align your content with these folks so it isn't just getting up and telling road stories and playing drums which is what we did when we did clinics. And I still yeah. do clinics, but actually yeah. the irony is when I do clinics, I incorporate still most of my most important information because I think it still applies. Absolutely. And I may simplify it or I may play a lot, a lot more fancy drumming stuff because I don't drum that much because I'm, when I'm giving a corporate speech, I'm there to de deliver content and the drumming is an augmentation, as you know, yeah, it's the clinic because the clinic you play a lot, and they want to hear you play a lot. Or they yeah. Play. But um, and every clinician is different. Look, man, if, if I go to see Vinny or I go to see like Virgil Donati, I don't want him to talk. I just want to watch. I want to drool. I want to watch him just play. So <laughs> Jim loves that or stuff Or Thomas too. Lang, although yeah. these people like or Terry Bozio, but Terry and Thomas in particular have so much to say. They're so brilliant. In, in their communication skills as well, that you do want them to talk, as well as just completely drool, or Greg Bissonette, Greg's sure. a dear friend, you know. Yeah. There's, just, there's, there's so many, oh, I love drummers, man. I'm, we, such we, it's, I'm as big of a fan as, I, as, I, as I've ever been. I just, I, I always try to find what I like, you know? Totally, yeah, if you, get, if you get five drummers and they walk into a bar, plan on watching those guys be there till the lights come on and are getting right. physically removed from the building because we will talk <laughs> about things as big and as powerful and as spiritual as God and the universe and our purpose in life. And we'll also talk about widgets and drum pedals and pedal tension yeah. and what sticks you're using and all that kind of stuff. And it really is incredible. And, and I'm going to be hitting you up brother, because I have been uh, since this COVID thing, you know, here I am uh, preparing for over a decade, wrote my book. I'm out there hustling, trying to get the live jobs things change overnight and it's like I, I have a beautiful state-of-the-art studio in Nashville and now that I'm, I'm a man in transition I'm spending more time in Los Angeles I got to figure okay am I going to go get a lockout and make it look beautiful and fill it with all the right gear to do this thing or am I going to try to chase this American dream like you which is very impressive you bought a house in Los Angeles from drumming and you have a place in your house to do your presentation so for me I've got to be able to have this offering when I'm out west so I've got to find a place to do this. So that's my next uh, next move, you know, and it's terribly well, exciting. And, and we were so fortunate. The, the space I'm sitting in that you're seeing, we converted our garage right before COVID. It was actually 95% yeah. done when, yeah. when, we were, when we had it. And it's for my wife because my wife's a photographer and a writer, so we made a space for her. Um, 
But as it turns out, I now use this space for my virtual presentations. Now I don't play live drums when I do my virtual presentations. Are you using Roland drums? No, that's the only part that's pre-recorded. I, I, I pre-recorded it with my big green screen. So all the performances are still there. They're just not live because I haven't been able to, I, I, it's not feasible to do that here. And my recording yeah. studio is so um, crapped up with stuff and the internet yeah. is, I'm not got crapped up, just filled up with stuff. It's not a good yeah. space. And you really need multiple people. So when COVID ends, I would love to be able to do virtual presentations and play live. It's yeah. just, I'm doing it all myself because we are very strict about the social distancing and very strict about everything. So yeah. I've learned and taken, spent countless hours figuring out how to make the virtual presentation work better with a green screen and finding the right camera and the right uh, platform and the lighting and the timing and the way to still make it interactive. I, it, I, I'm glad to go over all of it with you. And share uh, I, will pick, I will pick your brain, brother, because, yeah, I will, I, will pick, I will pick your brain. There's, because, a, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if they don't, if they're not expecting live, super, super live drums and they're okay with that, I have so much HD pre-recorded stuff that I could use. And the other thing I did, I did a thing for Oracle the other day and I did a drum solo and I customized the drum solo. I was like, Oracle, or, yeah. you know, and I was like doing that. And then the other thing I was, I'm doing is kind of like, you know, virtual hosting. So then you could just do some talking heads like this with some high quality audio. Then they take that and they put that in their presentation and it makes it feel like they've got like a Mario Lopez or a Seacrest to help the presentation right. along, which That's is kind of awesome, fun. Man. Well, so you're, Jim, you are, you're an amazing MC. Oh and man, I'm trying, look at me. I've already dented this thing by dropping it 5,000 times. Jim, what do you want to ask a world-class drummer? <laughs> well, I was going to ask, uh, you know, you had mentioned Cardone and Gary Vee earlier. Uh, isn't, aren't they, they're two, like, they're on opposite sides of the spectrum. Wouldn't you agree? I wouldn't agree because I, I wouldn't think agree. Well, I like this already. What, what I love about both of those guys, those, both of those guys are completely, completely uncensored, completely unabashed, completely full of grit and absolutely honest and absolutely fearless. Their philosophies and are completely different. The philosophies may yeah. be different, yeah. but that but the, but each but they're in different businesses as well. Yeah. True. So you want to have different philosophies. Look, my philosophies may be vastly different than than a lot of other people's philosophies as well. But I I, I look for the similarities um, and I find both of these guys just to have wow, so much energy and so much power and so much success and so much cutting right, slicing yeah. right through all the bullshit <laughs> um, and just yeah. getting right to the core. And that's what I love about anybody. Just be emphatic, just be authentic, and just have high integrity with what you do. And both of those guys do. They may have different approaches, which is fine, but they are both like, super, super powerful. And talk about guys that cuss their asses off. Yeah, I know. And, and because that's who they are. They don't want to, they're, they're not interested in, in censoring or changing who they are for anybody. I mean, when I get on stage and I speak, I don't even say damn. I mean, I'm a rock and roller and I still censor myself because that's part of my brand. Also, that's who I talk to. It, but if you hire Gary Vee or you hire Grant Cardone, you know, and they cuss, that's you what get you get. What you get. And yeah. you're not going to tell them not to cuss because if you, if you tell them to censor what they do, then you're not getting them anyway. I can censor what I do because I practice censoring what I do and you still get all of the same content. I mean, on this, our, our interview, I think I've said, you know, fuck once, you know, but yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to cuss. I can and I enjoy it. And sometimes I'm emphatic and sometimes I'm on a roll. And sometimes I've had a few tequilas and, you know, here we go. Let's, let's do this. But um, I just want somebody who's completely authentic and somebody that has a point of view that's so strong that I can immediately walk away with just feeling completely inspired and have some, have some uh, uh, content that I can immediately use and work with. And with both nice. of those guys, you can. And that's what matters. Yeah, Rich, do you, do you remember it. when we went to go to his show, obviously, right? We went down there yeah. and uh, interviewed him in his own home turf. Do you remember what he did at the end of the interview? He kind of got a little blue. He uh, was telling some jokes that involved, uh, you know, 
lady parts and stuff. Lady parts and male parts. And yeah, my grant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was very, yeah. It's, oh, yeah. It's, it's, on, it's on the internet. On a bash. Watch it. And oh, yeah. uh, my wife was there, actually running sound, if you will. And re- as soon as the interview was over, and she actually remembers this, he beelined over to her and then said, "I am so sorry. I said that in front of you. I'm, you know, that's uh, you, if that made you feel uncomfortable. I really apologize." And she, both of us, were like, "Wow." That's yeah. cool. You well, didn't have, you didn't have to do that. That was well, you know. but I think that's also awareness and that's yeah. empathy and that's understanding your audience. And these yeah. guys are not, they're very smart. You need to talk to have the amount of success that they have had. They need to really be able to read and understand their audience. And he might have gotten into the thick of it with you guys. And then when you realize, yeah. oh my God, your wife's there, yeah. I need to go be empathetic, be compassionate read their energy and it was very cool of them to do that have you seen the know. interview between the two of them when both cardone and vaynerchuk uh, he had vaynerchuk on his show with him no i haven't seen that i will oh. but I, no, I, <laughs> oh, <buddy. Google laughs> I can imagine well tony <laughs> robbins has the the most foul mouth on the planet when you go to his seminars i mean tony's brilliant i mean but i think that's a new, new thing though that's that's what think, i'm wondering isn't that new? i think it's new it's not that new uh no? he's been doing it for well i mean What's new? This guy's been doing this stuff for over 30 years. 30 years. Yeah. Last, I don't remember, him, last, I don't remember him swearing like that, though. Yeah, but he, but because I think that part of the swearing is shock therapy. Pattern what it does is when you all of a sudden just hit somebody with that kind of word. Yeah. Because remember, Tony's all about changing your state. Yeah. So when you, sh- when you hit somebody like that, it changes their state. It kind of wakes them up. It shocks them. And when you, when you shock somebody, you tend to really kind of sort of... Sure. In, in a funny way, when you shock them, it opens up their chakras. <laughs> Until it doesn't because But he does it with it. purpose. He doesn't just do it because yeah. he's careless. Like, none of these guys are careless. <laughs> these guys are all precisely on point, I believe, anyway. They're way too smart and way too successful to let anything go by them. It's like when I'm designing my speech or Rich or when we're on stage playing with these artists – you, every single nuance matters. As I said earlier, every, it's every single note matters. Every word matters. So we, we need to have the responsibility to create, to maintain this success, to pay attention to all of the nuances. And I got to believe that these guys are doing the same thing. They may be less inhibited. Like, you know, look, if I was worth $100 million and I felt like cussing to a speaking client, I'd probably be more inclined to cuss and not care so much. But I'm not worth $100 million and I'm <laughs> still building my speaking business and yes. I do, but I also, re- but I realized that I am also speaking to a very diverse crowd of people. Some people are very religious. Some people are very conservative. Some people are um, offended. So my thing is I am there to be of service. If you're there to be of service, and it's easy to um, censor what you say, yet still get all of your information across the way that you want to get it, then why take the chance of offending somebody when you don't have to? It's unnecessary. Then you're being, then it's not about you anymore. Then you're not being absurd. Yeah. Then it's about your ego. It's like the hell with it. I'm going to offend them just because I can, and I feel like cussing, so I'm going to cuss. You know, I think it's a great choice, Mark. I think it's I think it's a safe choice. I think it's a responsible choice. And as much as I'm loving this conversation, we got to keep the lights on. So we'll be right back. The Rich Redman Show. We'll be right back. Well, our big tagline has been inspiring kids to rock on stage and in life. We changed it actually to inspiring the world to rock on stage and in life because when kids are here. They learn so much more than music. They learn how to be on a team. They learn responsibility. They learn to take responsibility for their actions. They learn to organize their time. And we try to teach them, you know, not to be that person that nobody wants to be on a tour bus with. (laughs) Connect with School of Rock today. Search School of Rock Franklin or Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. So, Mark, for the drummers in the audience, because I know there's we attract a lot of drummers, and they want to know some drum stuff or steal some nuggets of wisdom. Because let's face it, you've been at this a long time. I've been playing drums since 1976, Dinosaurs Roam the Earth. I think you're 
were pretty active right around there, you know, if not a little yeah, earlier. Than that. I was already playing professionally, man. I mean, that's I, I, mean, I was a teenager. I mean, you know? It's incredible. And when you look at the di diverse list of artists that you've worked with, I remember the first time that you and I got chummy. I went to go see you at the baked potato and you were filling in for Matt with Velvet Revolver. Oh, right. That was 2005. 2005. So we, yep. we started talking to each other around 2002, 2003. I was playing in Los Angeles. I think we were doing the Craig Ferguson show or something. I got out that night. Yep. You were playing the potato with this really cool saxophone player. It was like this fusion group. Yeah. And um, we, were, we hung out on the street and with your girlfriend at the time. We were all kind of kibitzing. And you were doing the, the Velvet Revolver thing. But this just is an amazing list of people. How, how do you approach each gig? Like, how would you approach a Stevie Nicks gig versus a Cher or a Pink or a Velvet Revolver? Well, as I said, I'm there to be of service. So mm -hmm. I need to, for me, I, 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 I just take into consideration who they are, what they want, what they expect. And I do a lot of listening. <laughs> um, it was interesting because all of, all of these bands have such different approaches, but it's still fundamentally me playing. So I'm still putting my personality and my playing and my style. I'm just molding it around who they are. With Velvet Revolver, I was there to be as Matt Sorum-like as possible because Matt's their drummer. So I wanted them and I wanted the audience to feel comfortable. Um, so I approached it to the best of my ability, the way that Matt would approach it, really listening to the live stuff, really listening to the studio stuff, and just trying to make it as easy for everybody else as possible. So it was a seamless, like with no rehearsal. I mean, essentially, I, I came in, uh, Brian Tishy did a few gigs, and then I did all of OzFest with like no rehearsal, and um, just did, we were playing, and this was like a hard rock, heavy metal festival it was like us we it was a uh, black sabbath and velvet revolver co-headlining and the rest of the bands were like shadows fall and like uh really heavy bands yeah um, and it was really interesting for me because i got to watch a lot of these like sort of younger drummers that were just like really crazy like 220 <laughs> 20 minute kick drums Cookies. And, you know, and i'm still kind of playing old school i was trying to play like matt with Stevie Nicks, when I got the gig, I studied, I knew that Stevie's favorite drummer was Mick Fleetwood. Ah. I heard that. So I studied Mick Fleetwood. And I even put, um, made my drums try to sound like Mick the first time I ever used pinstripes when I had a very low snare drum. And I tried to play in the style of Mick and the yeah. sound of Mick, yet still putting my own personality into it. Um, and, and, just listening as much as I could and, you know, listening to musical director Wadi. Um, same thing when I got the Simple Minds gig, I got the Simple Minds gig because I started, I got hired by Keith Forsey, who was a producer to play one song for them, which turned into nearly the entire record. And then I did a whole tour. And so a lot of that for me was I studied Mel Gator because Mel's such a great drummer. And I wanted to study what he was doing a lot, except the, except the record I played, which was my own style, so I could play my stuff. But uh, I'll never forget with Simple Minds, like at the very beginning though, it was, it was a, I actually misjudged. Because, you know, and don't you forget about me, there's that really famous Mel, Mel Gaynor feel, la la la, and it's, it's so definitive and so famous. And we did a couple of gigs and I took it upon myself to play a different film. And that was a bad decision. <laughs> Charlie Bichel, you know, the co-leader of the band with Jim Kerr, the singer, is like, uh, it's like, you know, Mark, I want you to play the fill like Mel. And the irony was, he remembered the fill differently. He said, the fill goes, jaka da da jaka da da jaka da So in his head, that was the fill, where the actual fill is one, two, three, four. jaka da 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 Right? So it actually, it's a different fill. But what I did is I ended up playing it like Charlie remembered it. So I was like, and then from that point on, he was happy, right? Yeah. So even his perception of the original film was different. But it was all a matter of like, I'm not going to challenge him. I want to make his life easy and simple. 
And then the interesting thing with pink, it's yet a whole different thing because with pink, everything, almost everything's programmed. Programmed. I mean, early yeah. stuff, there's a little bit of drums, but unlike you, who you play drums with your artist, pink stuff, she works with, you know, pr producers that basically program everything. Um, yeah. And occasionally there'll be a drummer, like they brought in Taylor Hawkins on one song on this last record, but we never played it. But everything else was like drum loops and they're basically repetitive drum loops. And so part of what the band does is the band sort of evolves the music. Uh, and here's a great example of this. So um, the song, um, what about us, right? Okay, so, because that was yeah. one of the biggest songs ever. And mm -hmm. gorgeous song, incredible lyrics. So, so the song basically was like a, 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 a pattern. It was like, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. that was the whole thing, and it never evolved. So when we started rehearsing, the manager said, you know, on this record, she really wants stuff to sound more like the record. Uh, and, and, and so we thought, well, okay. So we learned the song basically verbatim. There was no crunchy guitar. So Justin, who always plays like some really great kind of crunchy big choruses, we didn't really evolve the song. We kind of played it um, like it was from the record. And so she came in and she listened to it and she said, oh, and I was the one that stood up. I said, you know, we worked out a whole other version where I play really big toms in the chorus and Justin plays really big crunchy guitars. So we played that version. She's like, yes, that's it. Yeah. So one, of the, one wonderful things about that gig is we get to evolve it. So I put my signature on the original music and we evolve a lot of stuff. And we even come up with sometimes... Uh, like Paul Murkovich was, you know, has MD'd a lot of the stuff. Paul's the MD for The Voice. He's MD'd most of Pink's tours. So sometimes he'll put intros or outros or or uh, segues in between songs. And we get to play these really interesting and cool stuff. So yeah. it's about reading the artist, reading the musical director, finding the right balance of what is appropriate and what is inappropriate, and um, doing a lot of listening and doing a lot of studying and. I mean, I played primarily with very simple pop artists. Cher is an interesting, very interesting um, artist to play with because you're, we're literally playing five decades of music. Amazing. And I didn't realize, I mean, I played with Cher for nearly 20 years. And then I left the gig, I brought in Jason Sutter, Sutter our, our mutual dear friend. I didn't sure. realize how challenging what I'd been doing until I came in with Jason. And Jason is like a studier. This guy will study every nuance. He's incredible. But I had a complete V, um, you know, Roland V drum setup and a complete acoustic setup. And I was playing all the dance stuff on the Roland V drum and then the acoustic stuff. And I even had extra toms to emulate the Hal Blaine fills yeah. from the 70s, like on Gypsies, Tramps and Thieves and, you know, all these, you know, do -do 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 kind of fills. So I was trying to emulate like all these of decades of music yeah. and I found it was a very diverse set to play because I had this thing where I was like <laughs> and I was like kind of swinging my left hand on some songs and stranding it on others and this interesting hybrid of all this stuff and hybrid of electronics and acoustics and then when I started showing Jason I'm like wow this stuff's pretty damn complicated. I didn't even realize that. <laughs> and then he was learning and I was working with him on some specific fills and, and, but we had worked that out over years and years of evolution of, I played with her for nearly 20 years. That's incredible. That's five presidencies, man. That's kind of where my band and I yeah, are at now. Yeah. It's more than five presidencies. Oh no, it's five presidencies, right? 20 years. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? It's yeah, amazing. How long have you been with Jason Aldean? I've been there since 1999. That's insane. But you played on almost all the records, right? Yeah, every record, every one. television show, every, uh, it's crazy. And see, that's incredible. See, that's what the difference in your career and my career is. I came in, except for Civil Minds and Foreigner, I played on some of the Foreigner stuff. Oh, um, yeah. You did the redo, right? They, we recorded every a years lot they... of the original material as well, because yeah, yeah, they re-released yeah, yeah. some of the stuff because they wanted to uh, re-release it uh, and own the masters, so to speak. Um, but other than that, like with Stevie Nicks and, 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 and Cher and with Pink, there's nothing that's been released. I played on a few Pink songs, but they never got released. Everything else is just drum machine or maybe, you know, drummers have played on it years ago. Um, well, you, well and, you heard it here first, kids. This is, the, this is how you get a gig and keep a gig. You study, you do your homework, you over-prepare, you're flexible, 
you're providing a service, you're creating solutions for people, you got a firm handshake, you know your stuff. And I mean, playing, you know, I, th I think I read a story one time when you were playing for Simple Minds and you're playing a big festival in Scotland or Ireland for like 250,000 people. Now I have not done that yet. I played for 80,000 people in a football stadium, but that's a lot of people. We played at the Glastonbury Festival, which is like Woodstock, 225,000 people. Amazing. And like standing on the side of the stage watching us was Peter Gabriel, who was one of my absolute heroes. And you couldn't see the end of the audience. It was like rolling hills. They had timed PAs, like with, with time delays and videos going all the way across. And yeah, what a rush that was. And then one of my bucket lists, the last big gig we played with Pink on the last tour was Rock and Rio, 100,000 people. Uh, you could see the end of the audience, this was like a big parking lot, but it was like 100,000 people in Rio, and I love Rio. I also went to uh, Laba, which is the area where they invented samba, and I actually sat in with one of the samba bands and played shaker and did my best to do the lumpy Brazilian feel with the shaker. I, like, I, was, like, I was like trying so hard just, just to, you know, again, yeah. like, it wasn't about egos like, hey, I'm not a rock star sitting here with you. He's like, I'm trying to honor you guys and honor everything that you do and how great. And just the fact that I, you're letting me play shaker with you. It was like, oh, my God. you know. Yeah, some some Brazilian housewife that's beating on a pot and pan is giving you a dirty look oh, yeah. the right feel. <laughs> Jim, isn't this yeah. that part of the show? Yeah. No, but did we miss this it? This is your oh, favorite part of the show. It's my favorite part of the show. Thank you for this. But I take the fifth on this? <laughs> no. I don't think you'll have to. You think I don't just, have to answer? It, it's not a tap out question. <laughs> it's the random question, random question, random question of the day. You know, we all have things that we were into when we were kids, aside from drumming and everything. For me, it was uh, radio controlled cars. For Rich, it was uh, speed skating, right? I was a speed skater, yep. And Dungeons Seriously? and Dragons. Wow. Big tight quads. What were you really into when you were a kid? Girls. <laughs> I'm okay, saying, that's the I know that sounds funny, but like in elementary school and all the other boys are making fun of the girls, I'm like, bring them my way. I, me and my friend, Kurt Diesel, who was the only boy that had long hair because he had hippie parents, we used to pretend like we were the, Be we would run around his backyard pretending like we were the Beatles being chased by girls. <laughs> So it was always music. And then my older brother, six years older than me, just got me into all kinds of music. So always, it was music, 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 really. I, I didn't, I wasn't that great at sports. Um, what else was I into? Yeah, girls and music. That was it, you know. <laughs> Jim, that's it? That's the random question? That's it. It's so yeah. easy, right? That, was, and it, that and was, was like very easy. That was no hesitation <laughs> in answering. Yeah, you know, a lot of the things that you had mentioned earlier uh, goes along with the philosophy that I have. And Rich, you've heard me talk about this. Be them centric. And that's a hashtag. Right. So I like that. Feel free to use that. I'll send you a T-shirt. <laughs> that's a good. Can I, can I get it in a medium? <laughs> I <Yes>. sure can. <laughs> yeah, but Mark and I don't wear a lot of swag shirts. You know, it's got to fit right. It can't be that thick gilding stuff. Yeah, you know, you got to be careful. The thin shirt, the thin T-shirt. If it's a thick T-shirt, he's right. You know, I'll, yeah. I'll what is that about? It's weird. Yeah. Well, t-shirt. I've been doing this thing ri lately, Rich. And this, I'm, I, as you know, I'm always trying to advance my fashion senses. I've uh, mm -hmm. I've bought a bunch of funny sayings on t-shirts that go along with like Marvel movies and stuff. This okay. is the latest one I did. This is uh, it's a it's it's a picture of a football guy. Home run. Player. That says home <laughs> run. Because that's basically my uh, understanding of sports. Well, no, there was a there was a <laughs> There was about a five-year period where it was nothing but ironic T-shirts, and then there was a 10-year break, and now they're back again. They're coming back. It's, yeah, it's all ironic stuff. I have a shirt that says Stank Industries because it's supposed to be Stark Industries. And, right. Yeah. Well, I'm a big Marvel fan. Jim loves That's, the Marvel stuff. I, I tell you stuff. what. It's good stuff. I tell you what, Mark. It's a, you're, you're, you're a great friend, and you inspire a lot of people, including myself. And if people want to get in touch with you, I know that you get to get back to people right away. It's just your name. It's your name on the socials. On Instagram, what is it? Marky Planet? Everything's uh, Instagram and um, Twitter are Marky Planet. M-A-R-K-Y-P-L-A-N-E-T. My website is markshulman.com. M-A-R-K-S-C-H-U-L-M-A-N.com. 
And here's what I'm going to do for all you. I'm going to give you my personal email, email address. If anybody wants to email me, just say hi. It's mark at markshulman.com. That one goes right to me. Info at markshulman.com goes to my management. Um, but hey, we're all drummers. Feel free to contact me. Also, I, di I do one-on-one -on -one lessons um, via Zoom, but they are like, uh, I call them like an aggregate lesson. It's about, I, I, I analyze your playing, but it's about career coaching slash playing. So I just do one. And then I will refer you to my dear friend, Bruce Becker, if you want permanent lessons, because Bruce is the greatest teacher. I still study with Bruce sometimes. But if you're Bruce. interested in having like a career coaching lesson where I will assess everything, feel free to contact me directly and we'll work it out. I'll give you a special discount if you saw me on uh, Rich's show. I love it. And people always say, Rich, I love your website. I said, man, that is a very expensive, overpriced website. And I got the idea from my friend Mark Schulman. So we, we have to blame him. <laughs> it's your branding, baby. Your website's important, man. That's how you brand. So, totally. so you know, we, I, I just got a brand new sizzle reel, which includes some of my virtual stuff in it. And that wasn't cheap either because I used, the, you know, my favorite editors in Australia, David Ross. So, you know, yeah. there you go. You got to pay people for their time and talent. Jim understands that. Jim, thank you for your time and talent as always, buddy. You got it. And uh, to our sponsors, Angie and Kelly, the School of Rock Franklin, School of Rock Nashville. We love you. Supporting music education. We're all products of music education. Mark is a sitting, on the, uh, a sitting duck on the internet, and he will get back to you, I promise. Mark, thanks for sharing your time with us today, man. Brothers, mwah, big love. And good Rich, nature. can't wait to smell your musk, buddy. I can't wait to see you, buddy. We will socially distance our butt <laughs> off. And thank you, everyone, for listening to The Rich Redmond Show. You can watch it. You can listen to it. We're on Spotify. We're on Stitcher. We're on YouTube. Um, and leave us a rating. It takes 30 seconds. Leave us a review. We love it. We'll see you next time. We'll be here. See you. This has been The Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com forward slash podcasts.